Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. My uh, my podcasting spidey senses are tingling. I I have that feeling that the moment we stop recording, either today or tomorrow, you know, posting the episode thread, there's news. News is going to drop, like big news. I don't know what it is. I don't know why I feel that way, but I'm just certain. Maybe it's like a little bit of like doom because today Brad is suffering. Brad, <laughs> Brad, Brad tried to time his medicine for the start of the episode and um, – one of the three of us, we won't say who, was uh, an hour late coming back from the golf course. We won't say which one of the three of us. Well, it shouldn't have been 45 <laughs> degrees out there. It was bad. I wanted to die. I said, I mean, I said on the eighth hole, if anyone got a hole in one, I would jump right in that pond and swim across. And it's disgusting, but it's cold. What was it? Yeah, it's 95 Fahrenheit today or something like that. At least. That's, you're an insane person. And honestly, oh, I hate it. I'd say you owe Brad an apology, but don't look him directly in the eye. I am not kidding. I think I saw him sneak a chest knife up here earlier. <laughs> I had one missing from the knife block. <laughs> All right, folks, back in the studio, maybe not for the best. This is the Winged Wheel Podcast here to talk to you about all things Red Wings hockey, uh, the world of the NHL, and hockey beyond that. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm like pretty sure I'm not contagious anymore. Anyways, I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. <laughs> Uh, on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, uh, besides the thought of impending news coming, not being able to tell what it might be, uh, genuinely, there's a little, there's a mishmash of uh, Red Wings news and then hypotheticals and things across the league. We'll start with Sebastian Cosa and what he was able to accomplish with the Edmonton Oil Kings and the WHL. Uh, some news that might be related to Tyler Bertuzzi, um, updates on Elmer Soderblom. Uh, the coaching carousel continues with, as suggested last episode, some actual concrete updates. Guys are making decisions and coaches are landing places and we're moving f towards some solutions, maybe not for the Red Wings. Um, there's a depth signing. We'll get into a prospect profile and we'll see what else comes up before overtime. Okay. Uh, before that, a couple of points first and as always this uh, podcast uh, is really really proud to support the jamie daniels foundation uh, we do so a few different ways first of all every winged wheel podcast night at the lca that is in partnership with our friends at the detroit red wings uh, all the tickets sold a portion of those proceeds have gone to the jamie daniels foundation as well as the wings money in the board campaign that we started in partnership with prashanth Iyer. we're very very close to our thirty thousand dollar stretch goal for the season uh, so we're really really excited about that more to come. The flannels are going to contribute to that as well once we get that sorted out. And uh, maybe in a week or so, some big news about Moritz Cider will also help trigger some donations. So uh, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org to find out more about uh, the mission they're on and how you can support them. Also, up on the wingedwheelpodcast.com blog, the first of, uh, I believe, two parts of Tony Ferrari, our good friend, our favorite ball draft analyst, um, his draft rankings are up on the wingedwheelpodcast.com blog. So as of right now, the time of recording, his rankings 50 through 100 are up. And then probably by the time you're listening to this or soon thereafter, uh, picks one through or rankings one through 50 or one through 49 will be up there. So really, really love Tony's work. Tony is like ever since he started has just like it's been quality content year after year. And it's been uh, it's a real privilege for us to be able to to work with him and, and host his rankings on the site. So make sure to go check that out. And we'll put a link in the description. Quite frankly, I'm shocked he had Shane right at 72. Yeah. Evan at 55. Although after today, there's going to be some uh, some truancy issues that are going to knock him down the board. You're not going to be an Eisman pick with that. No, time. absolutely not. No, you're going to be who would draft Evan? Who would be OK with that? Pierre Dorian. Oh, yeah. No, Evan almost clocked him. So that one's off the table. <laughs> yeah, you did. You, right. almost, you almost bowled over Pierre Dorian That's in the right. arena. What organization is Mark Bergevin in now? LA. Oh, there you go. You're going to be a king, buddy. Look at, oh. him. Look at him with his polo. Every button undone, face. Look at my sock tan. Oh, my God, on the camera. <laughs> It's like I. It's like I'm already wearing socks naturally. <laughs> we, just got de we just got demonetized for that. <laughs> or did we? <laughs> <laughs> oh god you got your tan and everything too you fit the bill off the rails off the rails this early all right um sebastian cosa feast or famine the entire whl playoffs 
like we mentioned before, and I, I Prashant had a good thread on Twitter about this where he was either like an 800 to an 850 save percentage in a game or shutout and almost no in between. So with his fifth shutout of the playoffs, second of the championship series, he secured uh, the w- WHL championship for the Edmonton Oil Kings, who are champions of the Western Hockey League and now get to move on to the Memorial Cup to uh, battle as champions of the CHL. So exciting news if you're a Red Wings fan. He did just enough. Yes. That's the, that's the best way I can put it. He wasn't bad. He was good. Didn't have to be brilliant, but he did enough. You know, we were talking to Prashanth about it, and uh, he had some stats. And you, you go and check the kind of shots that he faced. And again, this isn't going to be a knock on Sebastian Kosa. It's like, it's really excellent to see five shutouts in a playoff. But a lot of times he was untested. Like that Edmonton Oil Kings team is dominant with the puck. They are absolutely dominant. The team defense and the puck control means he's he has way more games where he's seeing shots in the teens at most than mo- most other goalies in the CHL. So it's a, it's a peculiar position, and a lot of times you're like, how much of that win or that shutout can be attributed to the goalie? And conversely, how much of that like random like 850 save percentage game can be attributed to the fact that he only saw 14 shots or something like that? So feast or famine for a good reason. But um, in the end, it's it's nothing but a huge positive for for Kosa, for the Oil Kings, and, and for Red Wings fans. If he goes and has a, a dominant Memorial Cup, though, that would be massive, massive for Red Wings fans. And obviously the uh, difficulty in the Memorial Cup should go up. Correct me if I'm wrong, there's still a chance that all three champions could possibly have a Red Wings prospect, or it could just be Costa still. Because Windsor is playing Game 7 against Hamilton as we speak right now, so Pasquale yeah. Zito could yep. go. Uh, Hamilton doesn't have any. And I don't know if Schwinnigan and Charlottetown is over in the queue. I know Schwinnigan was up 3-1 last I saw, uh, so Plandowski could make it if Charlottetown completes a miracle comeback, but at least we get at least we get a, one of our premium prospects there for sure now, which will be worthwhile. Yeah, there's uh, there's something to watch. Obviously, Kosa like headlines that. Oh yeah, first round pick, hopefully goalie of the future. That makes a big difference there. He is a monster on skates. He literally looks like he's playing with his like like in a kids league. He does. He looks and like. He looks like a All grown kinda. man too. <laughs> like I made the joke um, about Elmer Soderblom compared to you, but he's the same thing, but a net. He is a massive, massive man. You, you, you see Sebastian Cosa, and you understand what the Red Wings see in him. He's colossal, and he's immensely talented. What did we say when he was drafted, especially um, in in relation to Jesper Wallstedt? Wallstep, a more refined goalie, a more technical goalie. Kosa, a lot more kind of think instinctual, a lot more reliant on raw talent and has a lot of room to put it gently for refinement. I think the term for goalies is reactionary. Yeah, that's fair. He's more athletic though, so it works for him. Um, but yeah, he's, he's still got some refining to do. And quite honestly, with his talent and size, the CHL is not going to provide him that challenge it's a good segue so i want yeah. your opinion what's going to happen next year i i think he has to go to the ahl um like obviously it's good that he won a championship this year and it's good that he had a good year and you know you can only stop the shots you face right you know if you're not being tested you can't you know tell your defense to get the hell out of the way i need to work on some things but he's not going to work on those things in edmonton he needs to be challenged. He needs to go up levels, and that option for him is Grand Rapids. Is that too big of a jump for a goalie like him, though, who still needs – I agree. He needs to be more challenged. Is that too big of a jump for a goalie who needs more technical refinement to his game, who needs a more balance to how he's playing, the anticipatory play, the positioning – I don't think so. I think even if he gets shelled for a good chunk of the season next year in Grand Rapids, it's not – the worst thing for him because if he's getting beaten by his flaws in his technical game, that will just further his development to refining them because he doesn't want it to keep happening. Because 
I don't think there's a shooter in this world who on a talent to talent, athleticism to athleticism basis has a significant advantage over Kosa. I think that part isn't any worry. It's just ironing out the warts in his game. And at the CHL level, he's not being challenged as regularly as he needs to be, even in the playoffs. Like you were saying, there was playoff games. He was getting sub 20 shots. That's not going to do a whole hell of a lot for his development, even though if he ends up in a shutout with that game, it's a nice boost to his confidence. Now, between, you know, the Red Wings have a lot of openings in goalie right now, like top to bottom in the organization. Yeah. There's nothing that says Kosa has to walk into Grand Rapids next year and play 40, 50 games. No, 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 no. So, and he wouldn't. No. So if he comes in and he plays a third of the season in Grand Rapids next year, yeah, that's a lighter workload than he's getting in the CHL, but those are going to be quality starts against quality competitions. And every day in practice, you know, he's going to have NHL caliber shots coming in on him constantly. So I think the AHL is the right move for him. Um, But with goalies, you never know. But it's technical work. I'd, I'd honestly rather – it might come down to I'd rather him be working with the better goalie coaches – yeah, that's fair. Especially if you want, I, I can understand that argument. Um, there is there a risk though of moving him up too soon? Goalie is a mental position. You move him up too soon, he gets absolutely bombed for a year. What does that do to his development? He's still young, right? Yeah. Well, who is it? Mac, uh, Max was saying in the group chat, he's like, "You can't shake this guy's confidence." Yeah, he's, he's so, supposed to be a mental if, giant. If there's a guy who can handle it, it sounds like it's him. So with the oil, oil Kings being this good, you have to anticipate as it goes with ju- junior and feeder systems, they're not going to stay this good. You get incredible and you eventually kind of deflate a little bit as those guys graduate, unless you're the London Knights and, well, no, I'm not going to make that joke. London Knights didn't even get out of the first round this year, bud. Where have you been? I, I know. I know. I was going to take a cheap shot at them. Um, oh, I'm. there's always time for cheap shots at the London Knights. <laughs> Always, <laughs> yeah. Between Kitchener and Win- Kitchener and Windsor fans in this room, there's no London Knights representation. No. Perfect. Yeah, that's the way it should be. So let let's say the Oil Kings get worse and Kosa goes back there. Could that be a net positive for him? Because yeah, he's going back, but to a worse team with a tougher challenge. Or does that also make things worse because he's in a lesser league than the AHL or that system, and then also not getting the same quality of shot against him, right? Yeah, it's it's go, it, you know if it was a player, it'd be a, so much easier to kind of make a determination on this. But goalies are weird. Like if they win the Memorial Cup, I look at Sebastian Kosa and say, what else is there really for him to get out of this league? Um, it's gonna be you got to be certain that you make the right decision. You know, there's nobody all that strong in Grand Rapids. You know, he plays 20, 25 games there next season. You know, continue it as a development season. That could work out. I just, when you win the Memorial Cup, I don't know what there is left in the tank to, to repeat. I, uh, I on a previous episode, I did say, I think there's a good chance that Sebastian Kosa goes to the AHL. And someone who doesn't work for the Wings, but, you know, in the league in general, called, like straight up just called me an idiot for that. And I was a little surprised, but I do think about it. And then I do think part of this is wanting to kind of rush him in. There's probably a bias in here because he was drafted so high. And not only was he drafted so high, the Red Wings gave up draft capital to move up higher to take him. And you're like, mm, you want this guy in sooner because there's always that uneasiness when you spend that kind of draft capital on a goalie. Because I think who else could have been taken, right? Um, so probably a little bit of patience is needed here. I still don't think it's insane to say he could go to the AHL. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, Brad and Evan, actually, just now. There's there's only so much to be had out of the WHL. I don't think it's the end of the world um, if he does go back. I've been, after thinking about it and after chatting with some people, I, I do understand the case to go back to the WHL. But, I mean, the Memorial Cup, will, I think, will have a big impact on that. Because if he goes and dominates the Memorial Cup, like if he pitches another three shutouts or something ridiculous like that, then it's like, ah. You hate to base the future on such a small sample size, but at that point, that's a statement, right? So Yeah, small sample size, though. Which you always got to keep in the back of your head. We'll see how it goes. Speaking of goalies in the system, uh, the Red Wings signed 
mostly his depth. This is an AHL guy by all rights. Uh, out of the KHL, Finnish goaltender UC Olkinura. Ol- Olkinura. I'm going to get blasted for mispronouncing that one. So all of our Finnish listeners, I think Lassie, you were the one who helped us with Kapo, Kako way back. So please let me know how I'm mispronouncing that one. To a one-year 2A contract, minimum $750,000. So the 2A means he gets an AHL level salary and an NHL level salary, which means they're probably expecting him to play in the AHL quite a bit. Um, he played in K in the KHL last year with, was it Magnitogorsk? Yeah, I think Metallurg. Yeah. So and he pitched good numbers in the KHL and, and with um, in the Finnish Elite League before that. So yeah, I mean, he's what, 30, 31. I, I, he's been good in the KHL and the league levels. So that's always a positive. I think probably what got him a contract more than anything is he had just a ridiculous world championships. Yeah. With like a 1.1 goals against average. And I think he had like a ridiculous shutout streak right in the middle of the tournament too. So you hope. That you catch lightning in a bottle on that one, and maybe he can spot fill in the NHL. Maybe if things go really well, he's your backup this year. Can't rule it out. I wouldn't say it's likely, but it's a dart throw. It's what it is. Yeah. It's, it's a body. It's it's a veteran body as well. So let's say you do move a Sebastian Cosa in there or whoever else is playing in the AHL is younger. You need an experienced veteran to be in there. If Costa goes to the AHL this year, not only do I think it's unlikely he plays a majority of the games, it's almost undesirable for him to just jump into the fire like that. So you need basically what Bernier did for Detroit and to a degree Grice did for Detroit, but just at the AHL level. Absorb the shots there. Um. So yeah, we'll we'll see how he does. He has the same birthday as me. I'm looking at it right now. Neat. When is that, Evan? No idea. <laughs> ah. Speaking of birthdays, you just got to your phone before I did. That's all that happened there. No, no, I wasn't gonna. I, okay, oh, Brad, I I thought you were gonna brag about that, getting the drop on me on that one. I co- I come after you for a lot, and half of it is unwarranted. I'll admit that. I have nothing on you for birthdays. You have so thoroughly embarrassed me with your capacity to be a good friend and remember this. And Evan and I both. Yes, I am dragging you down with me. Just absolute garbage human beings. Anyhow, Evan escaped last Sunday's episode. Without us acknowledging his birthday. So Monday, retroactively, happy belated. Oh, yeah. Today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Happy Turn belated, back. belated birthday, old man. You look yes. you look a year worse, I'll tell you. I feel five years worse. You are dangerously close to your mid-30s. Well, not dangerously close. When does mid-30s start? 33 or 34? You're getting, you're getting there. Isn't mid considered the middle, which would be 35? It's not one year. Then I'm not even in my mid-30s. Mid, my mid For you, Brad, it starts at 33. Evan, I'll give you 34. Yep. Okay. I got a pillow for my birthday. It was great. <laughs> you were that keen. Now you're in your mid-30s. <laughs> yep. It was nice. How was it? How were your first couple nights on it? It was good, but... <sighs> I I have cursed myself because I was like, I'm going to get a good night's sleep. I'm going to get some good golf practicing because I got my first match play on Friday. Woke up this morning. I couldn't even turn my neck. I was like, what the actual shit is wrong with me? (laughs) I was like, no chips, no pop, you know, limiting my beer. Just trying to get in the zone. Woke up this morning. I had to rotate from the hips. I could not move my neck. So sometimes I talk to people and they ask about the podcast and they don't know about it and... You know, they ask questions and then they, they, you know, eke it out of me that it's like, this has been long running, like seven and a half years. We're going on strong. Like we'll hit a decade eventually. Like this, it's a great thing. And they're like, that must be amazing. Like the watching the fan base and, and the listenership and like your friendship with each other grow over time. I'm like, no, the whole thing is just an exercise in entropy and our bodies decomposing. That's it. Like <laughs> this just our a science small, experiment. Yeah. It, the world's longest, shittiest science experiment as our bodies fall apart. Anyhow, happy birthday, old man. Yes. Thank you. I got you the allergy pill that you just had. It actually worked immediately. I, I am not being funny. I'm never funny, but I'm not trying to be funny here when I say I keep allergy pills stocked in this house for Evan. Was I supposed to, swallow that or put it up my nose i can't remember what yeah. the appropriate way is to do that but different these... paths to the same result <laughs> <laughs> both both of the D, the uh the intake options were different than what you did which we can't say on okay air. um okay more red wings news elmer soderbloom was named 
uh, Young Player of the Year ahead of others um, like Simon Edmondson and Uri Slavkovsky. That award, uh, awarded by the Alliance of European Hockey Clubs, or EHC, is awarded to the most valuable under U22 uh, player in European hockey during the past season. So, hell of an accomplishment for Elmer. Uh, previous winner, last year's winner, Moritz Sider. So, we're narrowing down the uh, European awards. Hammering it down. We're collecting, I should say. Oh, oh, oh yeah. We're hammering it. Yeah. Hammering it down. Listen, yeah. man, it's like 9.30 at night. My thinking stopped two hours ago. That's on you, man. Not you, Brad. That's on you, Evan. This is your doing. <laughs> yeah. So cool of Elmer to follow in uh, Sider's footsteps. Between uh, Elmer getting this and then Kosa winning the WHL championship, I watched my entire argument of – or my plea to people to – please cool it on prospects and your expectations of them like fall apart in flames. Just scrolling my Twitter feed. I was like, Oh God, <laughs> this is going to be a painful off season. People were mocking Soder blue on like the second line for the Red Wings in Grand Rapids In Grand Rapids. Oh, absolutely. But no, I, I saw very real ones to the second line of the Red Wings. And I was like, no, don't do that. Like in 24, 25. You hope you hope. Hey, I love to be wrong. You know us. We love to be wrong about things, but um, just just don't set that expectations. All right. Um, some light news about Tyler Bertuzzi. First of all, he donated his hair. It is bizarre seeing him like with a just normal haircut, like just plain old short hair. I hope he grows it back out. It was very easy to pick him out on the ice. Not that it wouldn't be otherwise, but like his flow was like a signature flow. Like the flow in the buck tooth is one of those things where if you just saw a silhouette with no face, like a, a graphic with a missing tooth, that would be. He you... looks like a stereotypical hockey guy. Yeah. Well, he does now, but he especially did before. Before he could have been a character on Letterkenny or like an extra. In he, he actually did look shockingly similar to one of the main hockey players on Letterkenny. Yeah. Yeah, he should grow it back. But no, that was cool of him to donate his hair. Um, and then speaking of Bertuzzi, a few people sent this to me. Um, not that I love doing uh, federal vaccination law rules or anything like that. But in Canada, there is there does seem to be a trend, as we mentioned before, of a general lightening of those uh, rules overall in terms of vaccination status regarding travel, citizens, reentry, things like that. So we're not quite at the point where it's 100% in the clear for Bertuzzi. Um, but it could get there by the time the season comes around. I don't pretend to be able to know what the federal government's going to do. So we'll see. And that is important for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, if that clears up by October, like October 11th, which is when the season is pegged to start, that means Bertuzzi plays Canadian games again, which is huge. You know, getting him in 14 more games a year or whatever it is, it actually makes a difference in terms of potential wins and points on the board for the Red Wings. And two, for those of you who are keen to mock trades and things like that, that opens up a lot, a lot of doors, especially knowing teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs are among the most interested in Tyler Bertuzzi. That uh, that would make a world of difference. So keep an eye on that one. It, it could change the game on Bertuzzi, whether you want to trade him or keep him. Well, it affects it either way. If you want the Red Wings to make the playoffs next year, those extra however many games, uh, they're going to matter a lot. Yeah, and not to say every time the the Red Wings lost without Bertuzzi was his fault or anything. It's just in general you want your good players playing more. So, fingers crossed that they're able to do that next year. All right, um, coaching news: Bruce Cassidy off the board. Ve Must be nice. Vegas in Vegas fashion moved quickly. They uh, they brought in Bruce Cassidy. I don't know, it seemed like hours after he got fired. It wasn't actually hours. It was like a week or whatever. But Vegas brings in Bruce Cassidy. He gets to guide the Vegas Golden Knights back to the playoffs, provided they're able to stay healthy next season. And uh, they get their guy. So I know Cassidy coming onto the scene was like trots, but right in the middle of everything. And so a lot of hiring processes got just kind of got thrown for a loop once Cassidy was on the board because you have to talk to him. Last guy on the market, first guy off the board. Good for him. What's old is new again. Yeah. And it, it's somewhat notable for the Red Wings because it is known that he, um, the Red Wings were at least interested in him and talked to him. So it's uh, – I don't know. I'm not upset. He's one of many good options. And I think that's going to be the theme here. Like I think Trotz will eventually go off the board and not to Detroit. And you're like, ah, bummer. You wish you would have come, but – it is what it is. Cassidy, same thing. Whoever else you like, there's a million 
really, really, really good coaches in the NHL. This isn't like top six centers. It's not the same thing. Uh, John Tortorella seems to be close to signing in Philly. Hell yeah. I'm all, I'm here for it. Tortorella in the city of Philadelphia. This is just about as maximum chaos as we could have hoped for. My take on this one is it's either going to be the perfect fit for Tortorella the first time in a long time where he's going to have a long runway. You know, it's a long-term fit, a, a long leash here. It's not he's not going to lose the room or it's going to be total nuclear within like 24 months and it's going to absolutely crash and burn and absolutely no in between. How mad is Cam Atkinson right now potentially? I think he loves him. Does he? Yeah. Yeah, I've I thought I heard that Cam Atkinson loves torts. Tort, there's apparently quite a few fans of torts like uh, from his time around. And and let's well, get- most most people love John Tortorella the person. But all right, seems like a a good dude, even if some of his hockey opinions might be a little outdated and antiquated. But like he rescues dogs in his spare time. I like John Tortorella as a coach too because I think he just tells you how it is, and there's no gray area. If you're a member of the media and you come in having – like you're just off. You have some brain fog and John Tortorella like eviscerates you for asking a somewhat off question. I can see why you don't really love John Tortorella. Um, but to give him credit as a coach, I genuinely think he has gotten better over the years. Like you don't yeah. – s- you still see the kind of same end game with John Tortorella wherever he goes. But it's not so – you know harsh yeah it, it's <laughs> softening a bit he's he's finding a softer landing each time and it's you don't often see that with coaches like they're not different than players like they'll improve over time and especially as they get more and more exposure um and in different systems and they learn like getting fired isn't easy what better motivator than losing your job to get better at what you're doing but sometimes you see coaches just stick to old habits like frustratingly so but John Tortorella, I think, is a coach who did get a little better over time. So, I, I don't know. I'm rooting for the guy. I mean, he got his cup ring 18 years ago, but I digress. That's yeah, – I don't think he'd be mad. He's mad about that. The the direction Philly is taking, though, like the in terms of management, what they're doing with their players. Oh, that franchise is screwed. We could have a much longer conversation about the the classic case of a team that, like, desperately needs to rebuild but just doesn't see it, won't accept it, and is just going to – hang on for dear mediocrity for a long time, maybe make the playoffs a couple of years, maybe not. You know, someone asked a question, I think last overtime, like whose first round pick would you target? And Philly's what the answer there, right? Yeah. A thousand percent Philly. 2023, 2024. If you can get that first round pick. Oh, good. You're like, yeah, do that. Garrett, like they could make the playoffs. You never know. They got a wide range of outcomes the next few years. A, cha- a team with a chaotic future as a chaotic coach and their mascot is gritty. I I like how Philly is just leaning into the Philly of it all. Like I said, future of the franchise, who cares? I don't care. I have no vested interest in Philly. The maximum chaos scenario is playing out beautifully here. It's going to be a good time. Um, And then not massive news, but it was reported like the small crumb of information we have about uh, Eisenman and the Red Wings is reported uh, by Fridge that... Eisenman is casting an especially like notably wide net on his search. Like there are coaches he's he's looking at that have NHL experience. You know, we know Trotz was in that mix. We know Cassidy was in that mix before he got hired. Um, a couple other names have been floating around some prominently. But he's also taking a look at guys, younger minds who are in the game who often don't get brought up for head coaching conversations and don't have head coaching experience in the NHL. So you know, think of the Benoit grew, think of the uh, the assistants in Tampa Bay, and I'm sure a lot of the people that Prashanth talked about in his um, If I Were Steve Eisman article, the part two one, um, the part two of the art, art series, there are tons of people in Europe, um, the NCAA, there are a lot of, a lot of qualified coaches here. And um, it's not a surprise because who told us this first? Steve Eisman. He said he's going to consider anyone and everyone who could fit the bill. And uh, that's what it is with with coaching. Okay. Uh, why don't we take a break here and we will come back and talk about a couple of things. One being trade proposals, which I know we all love. <laughs> Brad, you can't roll your eyes into the back of your head because I'm concerned you've actually, you're having some kind of uh, 
medical attack here. I'm getting there. You're getting there. All right. Uh, we're going to take a break here to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, a sponsor that gives hockey fans what we really need, even more excitement in the game. There's so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. They are simple to use with great odds on different betting markets, giving you more action every game day. Plus, they're tons of fun with unique bet types like same game parlay and exclusive promos on the biggest events. And when you win, you get your winnings back safely in as little as 24 hours. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win that first bet. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you get up to $1,000 back in site credit. What we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with that risk-free bet and be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. Must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, or Virginia, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789, 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. I'm going to give Brad a little break here. I know you're scared of the trade proposal. So we'll start with a prospect profile. And uh, one of the prospects who I think maybe not the most likely pick, or or I shouldn't say most likely, maybe not the most popular pick, but one that I think should definitely be in consideration based on the talent level and depending on what the Red Wings are looking for. So none other than Pavel Minchikov, left-handed defenseman out of Saginaw, and uh, I think a sneakily impressive player in this draft class. Start us off, Brad. Well, how many times have we had the debate about uh, the all-offense defenseman who needs to be refined defensively? It's what you get in Minchikov. You can make the argument he's the best offensive defenseman in this draft if you're talking about just the offensive zone. Don't know if I'm quite there on him yet, but he's definitely in the conversation. Excellent transition, takes a ton of risks, and executes them very well more often than he doesn't. But those ones he doesn't do tend to burn him. Um so if you're if you're looking for that, you know, I don't know what to call archetype of a defenseman, he'd be the guy in this draft. And uh, considering Nemec is probably off the board by the Red Wings pick. And uh, do the Red Wings have a defenseman like this in their system? No, not really. So if they, if they're looking for that guy, this could be the option um, in the range. Now, I did read an interesting quote um, earlier today saying that, you know, even though his defensive game is a huge concern, he's playing on a team right now that doesn't really have a lot of yeah uh, good defensive structure. Right. So part of that could be Minchikov himself. Part of that could be blamed on Saginaw. Um, if he gets into a, a better defensive structure, uh, an organization that leans on it a bit more, who knows? I'm not saying it would fix that. I don't know enough to know that. But it is a thought that's out there. And if you think you can get Minchikov to be a competent defenseman, then he's absolutely a guy who should get top 10 looks based on what he can do at the other end of the ice. I have seen worse defensive, offensive defensemen, if that makes sense, yeah. that, than Minchikov, where I've said... Okay, but their offensive game is worth it. I think Minchikov's defensive game definitely needs work. Brad, the things you talked about, the risk taking and maybe getting caught out because he, you know, hopped up and jumped into the play and, and, you know, stretched for a play that maybe wasn't there. That's the kind of stuff that can be coached out of a game. I'm not making a player comparison here, so don't hold me to this, but think of Moritz Sider and what he was doing to to grown ass men in the SHL, just stepping out of his way to demolish them. And how much of that did we see in the NHL? It took us like 20 games or something before we saw his first like massive, massive hit. And that was a very clear direction from coaching and, and from what the team expected of him to say, just play a solid game. The rest will come. So that that's the kind of thing that can basically be coached out of a player. And it's the age old thing of you'd rather tame a tiger than paint stripes on a cat. Minchikov's offensive game and not just his offensive acumen. It's not just a big shot. It's not just you know, fantastic reads in the offensive zone, which he had both has both of those things. So he can be a threat on the power play and from the point. 
like you said, Brad, his exits, his transitions, his entries, the puck carrying overall with speed and puck skill and intelligence, that is, it's phenomenal. It's really, really great. The Red, the Red Wings don't have a player like that. They don't have a player like that, period, and they don't have a player like that on the left side in terms of defense. So that is a massive tool, and it's got to put Minchikov in the mix for the Red Wings in my mind. I understand he's not a centerman, and I understand that's what people want, but the more you watch his game, the more you think there eventually needs to be a complete, solid, like threatening top four on a competitive playoff Red Wings team. And it needs to go past your first pairing left-handed defenseman. And it needs to go past your first pairing right-handed defenseman, I'll say. Um, And Minchikov, he fits the bill uh, in terms of a guy who can make a difference for the Red Wings. And his defensive game's not bad. Like you said, Saginaw didn't have the best system to to kind of foster that solid defensive game for him. And sure, you'd love a more NHL-ready defenseman. You look at Juracek and Nemec, both those guys would likely be able to come in and make a much better responsible impact on the ice. But I think Minchikov has so much to work with and it's not a far he's not a far cry from being maybe as ready as them i don't know how long behind i'm not going to try to quantify it but i really like his game and he's only impressed me more and more as time has gone on well i'll say i like other players games they're more well-rounded at where the red wings are picking but i mean if you want to if you think you can get him to play some better defense oh my god do you take him at at number 8 um yeah like you guys said he's an offensive dynamo he's going to play a ton of power play minutes at the nhl level it's just how much damage can you mitigate when he's in his own zone um he's got the frame and he's got the skill set to be a top 3 top 2 defenseman on a team He's just got to get someone to to put it all in the tool box for him. Um, I don't know. Yeah, he, he's he's going to be a home run swing for sure, and uh, he's going to put up a lot of points. But I don't know. I, I, I think you go for maybe a safer pick on your first one. The context around Minshikov, too, further complicates things because we've seen – Late birthdays. Yeah, he's November. Yeah. Late November birthday. Yeah. So we've seen late birthdays out of the CHL picked high in the first round. Traditionally not work out great a lot of the time. And then you couple that with the fact, but he also missed an entire season due to that canceled OHL season. And you wonder, is he this dominant in the OHL because he's older? Is this about right because he missed a year of playing? Like, where does he fall on that? And I don't obviously have a good answer for that. Nobody does. This is unprecedented. But, you know, it it does further complicate an already complicated player. I'll agree with you, Evan, that it is risky. Like, those things I talked about with Minchikov, it's by no means a guarantee. And, and Brad, those are really great points. Like, it's it's a, it's a muddy vision. There's no clear path that you can uh, stamp him onto and say, this is how he's going to progress. Absolutely not. I don't know. I, I think I, I think I have to disagree though, in that maybe you want to take a safer player. Like who's a safe pick for the Red Wings at eight right now? Casper is Casper safe though. He feels like the safest. Cause you really know what you're getting. I, I, Maybe, maybe it's an I, upside question, but you know what you're getting. You think a guy who only ha- can play seventy percent of the ice efficiently is a safe pick? No. Oh, okay. Well, then what's your point? No, I'm saying like I'm okay with the risk. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to think back. I'm like, oh, did I just forget what I said? <laughs> uh, I forgot what you said. So <laughs> that's because you don't listen to me. Yeah. I don't know. I. And the the reason I'm looking at guys like Minchukov a little bit stronger too is because there seems to be a very prevalent voice. Part part of it's probably kind of our fault too. Is of course what would we love out of this draft? Find a center, number one center. Yeah, find a centerman who can be a number uh, who can play on the first line, worst case second line for the Red Wings, and then you solve the problem for years to come. And that would be great, but that's hard to do at eighth overall. It's not impossible. The Red Wings got a number one defenseman six overall, so it it can be done. And there are options there. Like Nazer has the upside. Casper could potentially have the upside. Savoy, if he plays center, 
which is a questionable. It could have the upside, um, but it's not certain and you don't know who's going to be there. So let, let's remove the center thing from the equation. A lot of people are saying, well, we have Sider and we have Edvinson coming in. Don't draft a defenseman. And all I can think is, oh, God, you need more than one pairing who can be good on the ice. We have half of one pairing right now. You think one other player is going to fix that? You need your second pairing defenseman to be so good that they would be first pairing defenseman on a lot of other teams. Like that's how – look at a team that's competing for the cup right now. That's what they have. You have a guy playing on a third pairing where you're like, I would love to steal him away from that team because they can't afford him. And he immediately slots into the Red Wings top pairing. That's what you need. Is it that too far reaching and too far thinking? Sure. But I just can't – I can't stop short at Sider and Edvinson and say, okay, the defense are solved. I think wingers are the only thing on this team where you could say if you don't add in a big way to that for the foreseeable future, you can still kind of be fine. And even that's questionable. I think that's even overstated. I'll just take best player available. Hot take, man. It doesn't matter what position they play to me because this team is still riddled with holes. Like, Brad, is there a single position, excluding goalies, because I think that's an obvious one, where the Red Wings draft it in the first round and you're disappointed? Hmm. Depends on the context. If there's two centers on there I like and maybe a couple dynamic wingers and they settle on a left defense, which would be their strongest. I just tore up my whole point. Yeah. it's <laughs> Yeah, but do I have full solid faith in any of them beyond Edvinson? No, I'm optimistic about a lot of them, but still, so... Yes and no. Like if if Savoy's gone and Nazer's gone and Casper's gone or Gauthier's gone or a lot of those guys are gone. That means someone must have have fallen. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the top five is starting to kind of emerge. The three forwards, Cooley, Slavkovsky, and Wright, and the two defensemen, Nemec and Yurchik. That only leaves two more players picked before Detroit. So this could still go in a billion ways. Now, if those two players are centers – then I think that really opens it up because, you know, if the Red Wings have one of the centers available to them and they don't love them, then, yeah, you you got to go outside of it. Um, but, yeah, like if we're talking about Minchikov specifically, if they picked him, like I'm like, oh, yeah, I get it. Let's – hell, yeah, let's ride. Ride or die. But uh, – what's, what's five more years of pain? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be that Where way. Where are you invested in this? Where are they drafting prime Steve Eisenman? I mean, they're going to suck no matter what. Who was the last amazing player the Red Wings drafted who uh, excels on the power play? Murray Sider. Lucas Raymond. Michael Rasmussen. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you making these kinds of jokes while Brad's this tired? He is going to kill you, my friend. And if you die in this house, I will be so annoyed. You know how much that will destroy this re- the resale value? He won't home? die in the house because I'm going to throw him through that window. Thank you. You're a good friend. <laughs> I don't think anything will destroy the resale value in KW. No. No, certainly not. Okay, uh, that is the uh, Minchikov prospect profile. I'm going to close by saying it doesn't matter how glowingly I spoke about him. I still take Nemec and Yerichek over him. In case one of those two fall, that is a run to the podium pick for me. Okay, uh, some speculation here. Gerard Gallant scratched Capo Caco for Game 6 of the Eastern Conference Final, a game that the Rangers famously lost. Caco... Notably found his form during the playoffs as the kid line was at times almost unstoppable on the ice. And they were making a big impact with uh, Lafreniere, Kako, and uh, Filipito. So with Kako being scratched and he is now a restricted free agent, a lot of people are looking at him and saying, the Rangers have some cap questions. The Rangers have some roster decisions. And does this scratch mean anything for Capo Kako's future? No. It- you think he stays, like, undeniably? Yeah, probably. What if he wants out? Well, that changes things for sure. That's a big move. I don't want to say it's nothing. Scratching him is a big move. And it's not about whether or not you agree with Gallant. I, I, this isn't playing, like, Austin Matthews 17 minutes in Game 7 of a mu- like or in a must-win game like Babcock did with the Leafs. For, for me, Kako is like, yeah, I don't know if I would have scratched him. Especially when you have like massively hurt Dylan Strom or uh, massively hurt um, Ryan Strom. Ryan Strom, sorry, uh, out on the ice. But regardless of that, does this make him movable? Do you sense that this 
this could mean for the player, for the team, or for the coach that they might want a different a change of scenery. And thus, is that a target for the Red Wings and a lot of other teams? But for our sake, the Red Wings. Short answer, no. His production actually went down in the playoffs. He was 18 points in 43 games in the regular season, 5 points in 19 games in the playoffs. Bum. He's been, and in the regular season, he's been at that just a bit below a half a point per game all three seasons. I know he's young, but like that's remarkably consistent for a three-year stretch. <sighs> okay. Rangers would be a fool to sell yeah, the, Kako. The, the buy price on Kako right now is very low. And the Rangers are insane if they do that because much like the Red Wings and Zadina, you're not getting the production you want, but he's still a usable third line winger in New York. Now, if his contract demands come in very unreasonable, that changes things, but he's not going to be in high demand around the league. And quite frankly, nor should he. I disagree with you. I think he will be in high demand. We've seen there, there, Depends what you mean, high demand. There's going to be a lot of teams kicking tires. None of them are going to willing to pay anything close to a premium asset. Okay. Uh, former second overall pick. And is underperforming. Does that work out every time? No. There are such things as busts. And you can't predict them. Because if you know a player is going to be a bust, then he's not high on your draft ranking. He doesn't get picked second overall. But still. Guy can't deny has at least a ton of talent somewhere in there. Lafreniere also started super slow in New York. There's enough there for me to look at that system. And especially from what I've heard with how Quinn worked with Kako for me to say, maybe this isn't all Kako's fault. You don't want to absolve the the player of all the blame. You have to, in the NHL, as Evan famously says, you just have to find a way to do it. The thing you have to find a way to win. You have to find a way to get there and, and cement your spot in the lineup. But those are two premium, a first overall pick and a second overall pick who had a hell of a hard time coming in in that system under Quinn. And then even this year to start under um, Gallant, I kind of want to take the risk on Kako. I don't know. You're right. It, it, they're not going to, they're not going to sell cheap, but Drury sell, sold Bushnevich cheap to St. Louis. It could be done. What would you, what would you give up? That's what it comes down to. Would I give up a first or second round pick for Kako right now? Not the Red Wings' first second round pick, at least. I mean, if the offer was only a second round pick, I definitely would do that. I uh, yeah, I do a second round pick without you do a doubt. Pick, you do forty, yeah. Oh yeah, just forty. I think that's the Red Wings' first second round pick. They have forty and fifty. Uh, I'll look it up, but yeah. only a second round pick is a... for a guy. He's an who's... RFA, right? Yeah, yeah. Only a second round pick. I do that. Yeah, I'm not sold on it. it that's wouldn't... interesting. Maybe the second second round. I don't, just you're the odds of getting a player of Kako's level at forty aren't that bad. They're not good, but like they're not that bad. And with Kako, we kind of seem to know what you're getting. Uh, I gotta disagree there. Like it's one of those trades. If it happens, I'm not flipping a table. I'm not angry. I could sit here and go, yeah, I get it fully. Okay, but but the Rangers would never do that. No, never it, in a million years would they do that. I will say I saw a lot of mocks of like Bertuzzi or Bertuzzi plus for Kako, and I think that's insane. Are you? I, I think Bertuzzi, you're trading for a, a very well established third line depth winger. Like he has been, for all the criticisms, he's been consistent. He has been remarkably consistent in his three years. He has been at this level the whole time. Okay, do you th do you think Kako under a different system with? More opportunity stays at a roughly third point per point three three points per game player. If he improves, I don't think it'll be dramatic. Yeah, man, I take that risk. I you, I'm not here, saying it's impossible the, that the, you're wrong. Here's the trade right? you make if you're Detroit, and here's the trade that makes sense if you're Detroit. Zadina, but no, flip. They're the same damn player in the same Kako's. damn position. Top ten picks, underperforming by all accounts, seem to be playing well. Just cannot produce offensively. I actually think I like Zadina's game more. <laughs> I don't entirely disagree. <laughs> this whole conversation is just full of stuff I disagree with. <laughs> yeah, but they're the same players in different circumstances. If you want to take a chance on Kako, cool. Our guy's not working out here. Try him there. Your guy's not working out here. We'll try him here, and hopefully they both get it figured out. 
Yeah. In a new system, in a new thing. Age, pedigree, almost everything's lining up identi- near identically between these two. To me, I spend that second round pick or so- a decent asset to – okay, let's say he lands as a third or – in your case, Brad, best case scenario is half point per game player. That's your best case for Kako. I still spend that pick because I still think a former second overall pick who was a bona fide second overall pick, there was almost no contest there, that he has so much more upside. I'm willing to just knock and see. I'm willing to take that on and knock and see. I, I'll spend, I would overspend in that trade to try and get Kako because I do think he's not been afforded all the opportunity in the world. I do think there might be something going on in New York that has suppressed two players who look like, you know, marquee young prospects to come in and make an impact in the NHL. And they just didn't right off the bat in New York. And they actually didn't for quite some time. And it was frustrating for Rangers fans to watch. And frankly, for hockey fans, there's enough untapped potential in there with Capo Caco where I'm willing to just try that out. I would overpay... The Red Wings have a, a a wealth of picks and have had a wealth of picks and will continue to. I'll spend a little bit more to, just to see what it's like. Well, a second round pick is an underpay in New York size by all likelihood. So what is an overpay for you? Are you giving up that second round pick and Philip Zadina? Mm. Philip Zadina's stock is super low right now, man. So is Capo Cacos, but the Rangers aren't going to ask that. How is the age difference? Like a year and three months or something? It's pretty... Minimal. It's, it's like a year and three months. Yeah. It all depends on what Drury wants, but I've seen Drury make trades before where I'm like, oh, yeah. If he's giving them away, oh, hell yeah. Put me at the front of the line. I'll take on any reclamation project at reclamation prices. And because, like you said, Kako is a second overall pick and a justified second overall pick, they're not going to. It's not like he was a six round pick who. Kind of overperformed for a bit and then regressed to what everybody thought he was. Like, uh, to be fair, also, Nolan Patrick was a certified second overall pick when he got picked. But anyways. He had brutal migraine issues. He was never good after he got drafted. <laughs> he was injured, like, right after he got That's drafted. fair. That's fair. I, I, Admittedly, the pick sucked. And every Flyers fan will tell you that. But I, I feel bad for the guy. Oh, yeah. No, I feel horrible for Nolan Patrick. But... I mean, just because a guy was picked, I doesn't always mean that 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 talent is there at the NHL level. I think I think there's something there, and I think there are quite a few suitors. I actually one last point looking at the, the Rangers before we jump into overtime here. Uh, Georgiev, they botched that by not shipping him while his stock was at an all time high. Yeah, and then he didn't have a great season. No, like, whoops. Yeah, I mean, it's easy twenty twenty. Hindsight, of course, you have Shesterkin playing as the second best goalie on the planet, and Georgiev not doing that great. But meh. honestly, I don't even think Kako's my favorite Finnish reclamation project in the NHL right now. Go ahead. I think I'd rather pull Yarvi. I would rather pull Yarvi because I think the price would be lower. You also, think the also, price would be lower. Yes. Uh, I'm getting crazy <laughs> pills right now. Like, yeah, the allergy pill I gave you. Is this the upside down world? <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> You think Kafka has had a better season than Pooley Army? Evans in cottage dad mode where he's mispronouncing names because he frustrated himself. Look at the forehead vein. What it's the out hell of- is wrong with you? <laughs> I think Edmonton is- I didn't sweat through a 45 degree <laughs> round of golf to listen to this bullshit. <laughs> You're killing him. <laughs> oh, it's look how the turntables it hurts so much. Oh, but it's so good. <laughs> okay, is that uh, an insane statement for me? I need you to temper me here. Bull YRV would cost more than Kako. Yes. Thank you. Is Edmonton not in a tougher cap spot where you can- Oh, we're I'm talk quality of GM could turn this on its head, don't get me wrong, but objectively from a common sense standpoint, Pool YRV should cost more than Kako. <laughs> <laughs> now it's it Ken all and Chris Drury, so all the bets are off. But all right, the only way we do this is Evan and I go downstairs. We also both pick a knife from the knife block. We, we meet, turn off all the lights. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and we just start swinging. <laughs> oh, oh God! I'm gonna re-listen to this in a day uh, and just see how insane I sound. But 
I'm glad I struck a nerve at least. All right. Well, uh, it seems like at least one, probably two of us are wrong at any different point. So let us know in the comments or however you're listening to this, wherever you can leave feedback, which one of us is stupid and wrong. It's you. The answer is <laughs> all of us. You need to really narrow it down there, Ryan, specifically to this topic. Uh, for better or worse, I'm going to move us along to overtime here. I'm watching the score of the Tampa-Colorado game one, and it's currently 3-3 with uh, about four minutes left in the f- second period. I'm angry no matter what, so. There you go. Okay, uh, we're going to move along to overtime, which on this midweek episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Uh, they're the reason we're able to do this show, <laughs> uh, cover prospect profiles, and run this during the offseason and talk about serious hypotheticals and crazy trade scenarios to just generally piss brad off so patrons thank you for aiding me in my never-ending quest of angering brad and sometimes evan if i can get to him you're doing a great job i am struggling right now my lungs sound like chip bags (laughs) patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you also want to support the show uh it really 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 means a lot to us Okay, first question, and this is a popular one, so uh, we'll we'll take it again. It's from Taylor F. says, what does it take for the Wings to move up to two for Cooley, and at that price, is it worth it? No. It takes a lot. Like, in general, the cost to move up is a lot. They'll start at Bertuzzi. They'll ask for Larkin, which in a quest to get a, a first-line center, you don't give up a first-line center. They'll They'll start at Bertuzzi plus eight. And they, they'll ask for more beyond that. And for me at that point, though I really like Cooley and though I really like Slavkovsky, I don't think you'd 100% take Cooley there. There is not a huge gap between the top of this draft and number 10, hypothetically. Don't get me wrong. There's a gap. That's why they're going to get drafted in their order. But it's not that significant. Like, I understand the appeal of trading up for Cooley or Slavkovsky. I get it. It's just... The Red Wings have to have the right deal in place at the right time with the right circumstances. Which and isn't I, impossible. I just don't see it happening. It's – it's. I'll call it very unlikely. Yeah, that's fair. It, it, I agree it's unlikely, but I don't know. How awful would it be if you give up all these assets to trade up and then the curse of the second overall pick, like we just talked about hits, and then you end up with nothing and you watch whoever picked at eight – yeah, you end. Excel. Yeah, you end up with uh, Capocacco or Nolan Patrick, and then a few picks later, it's Elias Pettersson or Kale McCarr or Michael Rasmussen. Evan. Like a a unsigned Bertuzzi, so just one year left on his contract. So if he gets extended, his value changes for the better for the Red Wings. Uh, but in terms of the trade machine that um, Prashant put together with Dom Lutician, uh the value, the approximate value. That the system spits out is New Jersey Devils second overall pick in exchange for Tyler Bertuzzi, the Red Wings eighth overall pick, and the Red Wings second overall pick, which is forty or whatever. Second round pick, yeah, no, yeah, second no. round pick. That's, no, no, you don't do that. In in my mind, you extend Bertuzzi, and if you if you want to trade him, look at what they got for Mantha. By all rights, Bertuzzi is more valuable, right? Mantha, they took Mantha. unsigned. He's not. Unsigned, he's not, but the kind of game he plays, it can get a lot of teams to to back up the Brinks truck and say... Yeah, you give Bertuzzi Mantha's exact contract right now, Bertuzzi's more valuable than Mantha was when we traded him, but as of now, unfortunately, to most teams, he's viewed as a rental. The one thing I'll say is, is I agree, Brad, that it's not likely, and I agree that the distance from the top of this, tra- this draft to pick 10 isn't massive in the sense that the upside for a guy who can be had at pick eight like let's say a Nazar or Savoy if they hit they hit in a way where you're like you're talking about those guys they should have been a top three pick yeah but I think Cooley and Slavkovsky are much safer to to hit in a bigger way agreed Um, yeah but that's not worth you're you're not trading Bertuzzi because someone's floor is higher I agree okay um Ginger Ginger Beard Man says, "Hey folks, I've been wondering about this for a while. Do you think this team, uh, the team that drafts a player, affects that player's future career? For example, instead of Zadina, had we drafted Hughes, is it fair to ask would Hughes still be as good for Detroit or Zadina as so so for Vancouver? That's a good question and, and a philosophical one that I think bears repeating quite a bit. 
yeah, development systems can and often do make or break players. Sometimes irreparably, sometimes not. But, you know, the right player in the right system can be saved from bust status and the wrong player in the wrong system can be destroyed when they were being seen as having a high floor. I This is why everyone's in the room when you do those interviews. Yeah, 100%. Because the coach is like, I don't like this kid, that doesn't work. Or the GM doesn't like this kid, doesn't work. And there's a reason a team like Tampa is churning so many non-first-round picks into productive NHLers. Like, obviously, the Brayton Points and the Nikita Kucherovs are the exception to that rule because they're so damn good they would have worked anywhere and they should have never went as low as they did. But who or what is Ross Colton, now a very good NHL player? Who or what was the seventh-round pick Andre Palat, now a very good NHL player? It matters way more than I think teams would ever be willing to admit. Um, <laughs> this one, this name, I'm reading this out purely for the name. It's Brad Crisco cheats at Gordel, um, which I think is a compliment to you. The sad thing is I know who that is. That's funny. They said Bertuzzi for Kako and Georgiev. I don't do that for a second if I'm the Red Wings. Yeah, no chance. Because let's look at it. The Red Wings have Kosa coming up through the system. Even if he's three, four years away, they have Nedeljkovic signed up for the next little while. And I don't know. Georgiev's kind of speculative. I don't see him adding enough value. I'd rather get the picks that you'd get from a Tyler Bertuzzi deal. No? Yeah, agreed. Do you cheat at Gordel? No, I don't. You get a lot of second try answers. I think I got it in four today. So take that, Arjun. Is that Arjun who? It's definitely Arjun. That's really funny. Um, okay. Another question here. Let's take this one from uh, Keenan O'Donohue who says, let's say the Red Wings draft Connor Geeky, even though he's the lowest of the guys projected that I would like them to pick. Are there areas of his game besides being big and playing down the middle that could uh, help this rebuild? Cheers, fellas, and thanks for all you do. Yeah, there's plenty of Connor Geeky's name, game where... Does he have a good shot? Uh, fantastic. I was going to say, I thought he had a really good shot. Yeah. Uh, uh, at worst an above average shot. And when he's on, which is a question with geeky is how often he's on, but when he's on, he can create plays getting there and moving the puck and the pace of play along is a big fat question with geeky, but his ability to create plays and generate offense is unquestionable either through his shot or otherwise. So. I think Kirby doc, but slower. Which is in terms of speed and pace. Geeky. I have concerns. Yeah, is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, Geeky's he's low down on that list for me. For I don't want to say for good reason. I don't know. There's just too much question. It's probably why I'm I'm veering away from Lambert as well. I think there's just too much risk. If this was a sparser draft where by pick eight there was like almost no high upside players to be had. I would say, yeah, swing for the stars and take a geeky or take a Lambert. Different players, mind you, but similar, you know, extremely high upside. But for me, for me personally, and I don't want to say for the Red Wings, um, but Savoy, Nazer, Casper, those are the kinds of guys where I'd rather kind of take a, take a flyer on them. Yeah, I don't even think Geeky's in the same tier as those guys. Is Geeky going to go anywhere close to top eight? I actually a lot of rankings I see now have him between 15 and 20. He is he is falling. Now, it just takes one team in the draft to go, nah, don't care what everybody else says. We like him. And, you know, Pierre Dorian grabs him at seven. But, yeah. All right. Uh, last question here from Evan's Parking Garage. Says, hey, gents, when looking at the draft, my favorites would be Lambert, Savoy, and Nazer. I'm aware I'm not in the majority of people when I say I'd prefer Lambert at eighth if he's still available. I think of Verona, Lambert, Berggren. Maybe Zadina line would be amazing as a second line in like two years. Two amazing playmakers and Verona as a sniper. Everyone on that line can be a shooting threat uh, when needed and can make plays. If we do get Lambert, I think the right move would be to bring him to Grand Rapids right away to play with higher talent to have step-by-step -step assistance when needed. Do you think we are the perfect organization for him to reach his highest potential? I think, traditionally speaking, we – and this is obviously a very short window under a new regime, so I have to unfortunately include the last like decade of – development with this organization i think we might be the one of the worst organizations for brad lambert to come in and succeed first i'll say our track record of developing guys in grand rapids who aren't already top end players yeah not talking raymond or cider here. exactly hasn't been great there's a few success stories success stories but there's a lot more failures um 
Now, again, very short time under Eiserman's management group, and that looks like it could be changing. Great. So optimistic uh, about that. But Lambert hasn't produced anywhere in years. You are not upping the level of his competition next year. Wherever you draft him, whatever you think of him, however much you believe in him, he is not going up levels next year, maybe even for two years, because dude can't score. He has all the tools in the world to score, and it's not even just goals, it's assists. Now, obviously, uh, Will Scouch put it like good context about like he's had some really horrific line mates. You can still score goals if your line mates suck. He hasn't even been doing that. Um, so I, I'm not out on Lambert. He's definitely fallen down my list. Still top 20, probably. Um, but no, I don't think we're the best organization for him. No, I probably don't take him at eight. And if we do, no, I'm not moving him up levels next year. If the Red Wings stayed about as good as they were, maybe didn't drop off so steeply after December, and they were picking like 14, 15, anywhere, let's say 13 to 16 or whatever. I'd be banging the drum probably for Lambert, knowing that everyone else would probably be gone by then. Yeah, you, you take the swing at that point because the guys who are left, their ceilings aren't nearly as high. Um, but yeah, it's – he'll – in a few years, however he pans out, he'll be an interesting case study. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Um, I was serious about Brad not dying in my house, so we are going to wrap up this episode of the Wing Wheel Podcast uh, so he can get home. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. The draft is fast approaching. A lot of exciting things for this pod- podcast are fast approaching. The draft live stream, um, the pre-draft show, the pre-draft or sorry, the draft preview, mock drafts, the post-draft recap, all of that good stuff. Uh, we're going to be upping the prospect profiles from here on out, and uh, just in general. Uh, we're excited for what the next month or so brings. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for the to the sponsor of this show, the FanDuel Sportsbook. To all of you who have been leaving ratings for us, uh, wherever you listen, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Google, anywhere, it, it makes a world of difference. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, especially our name level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, um, Ake Fur, the Stay Fresh Cheese Bag, Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan Hand has been in a Simon Jamathong, Matthew M. Rice, Brad Crisco cheats at Gordel. Arjun, I know that's you, but it's worth repeating. Brandon M., Carl Brutan and Analuski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Craig Kibble, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Doesn't Tuesnit, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Greech, Helm was held back by Blashill, Hassam Al Kassem, I'd leave my wife for cider. Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Kalen Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Marcus, uh, Matt McKay, Matthew Guest, brand new name level sponsor. Matthew Guest, thank you so much for joining the Dub Dub Club. And uh, we really, really, really appreciate your support. Nicholas Fritz, RA, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Sean Levine, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Zach Spring, Sam Bankson, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Adam, now I finish better than Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron. Aaron, I'm not reading that one out. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Connor Leighton, Dave W., Evans Parking Garage, Evans Bingo Card. It seems mix, Mr. McDavid has two girls. Now all he needs is one cup. Boom, got him. God damn it, Reed. <laughs> um, James Laporte, Jeremiah Adobo, Jeremy Brocker, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Maximilian Cheesebags, Papa Woody, Puck Norris, Revy DeLuca, Trevor Pevovar, Zach, Mc- Zach McCann, a driving range superstar, and Z Grass is always greener. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Brad, best of luck on your continued recovery. We'll talk to you all Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.